good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to our 24th Thought Leader session. My name is Marzia Zafar, and I'm the director of our Policy and Planning Division. These sessions are a Policy and Planning Division project designed to encourage creative thinking about issues affecting the industries we regulate. Today's session is about the intersection between regulation and innovation. The discussion will center will be about how government and entrepreneurs can help create a better environment to foster innovation and ultimately create a better product for the common good. We obviously have a very impressive panel of speakers today. I want to thank Nancy Fund for helping me get Elon Musk and Lyndon, Lyndon Reeve here today. Nancy is a founder and managing partner at DBL Investors and our co-organizer for this event. Thank you very much, Nancy. I also want to thank CPC President Mike Peavy for his leadership, his continued support of these efforts, and for pushing us always to be better. Uh, Paul Clannon, the Executive Director of the Commission, will moderate the session, and he is my boss, so I thank him on a daily basis. Um, and before I forget to, uh, before, before I turn it over to Paul to uh, start the session, let me just go over a few logistics and a very quick safety briefing. First, this session is also being webcast and broadcast to our, over, our overflow rooms today. I wish I could have magically enlarged this room to accommodate everyone. We tried different venues, but either they would cost money that we don't have or paperwork that I didn't want to fill out. <laughs> um, second, when we get to the audience Q&A session, we have a 45-minute Q&A uh, session with the audience. Please wait for me or Michael Colvin uh, to come to you and bring you the microphone. And that will start at 2.45. Um, and third and finally, uh, in the event of an emergency, please calmly proceed out the exits to the rear of the auditorium. We also have two emergency exits on the sides in front of the auditorium. And now I'll let Paul take over. Thank you, Marzia. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Paul Klan, and I'm the Commission's Executive Director. I work for the five commissioners here who are appointed by uh, the governor and, and confirmed by the State Senate. We're a statewide agency uh, that sets rates, oh, something equivalent to 50 or $60 billion a year. We've got our finger in every little bit of economic activity in the state. You can view us as the infrastructure commission, a lot of us do. We're also a court system. We've got uh, 35 judges who work in this building. We're about a medium-sized medium law firm. We've got about 80 lawyers working here. We're an accounting firm. We're a policy shop. Uh, we're many things, and we're here really to do one function, and that's to represent the people of California uh, in the industries that we regulate. We are very honored today to have three very distinguished panelists. I'm going to, and these are the three guys who don't need any introduction, I'm going to do a very quick two-sentence introduction of, of each. Then I'm going to ask each of them to talk for five minutes or so, a little bit more, a little bit less, about innovation and regulation. Uh, and then I've threatened all of them that if they don't then begin talking among themselves, I'm going to throw in some awkward questions to get them talking among themselves. Uh, then, as Marzia said, we'll have time, uh, a lot of time towards the end of the session for an audience-driven discussion about the topics that are raised. So immediately to my right is Elon Musk, uh, well known as a founder of PayPal, most excitingly to me, um, the driver of SpaceX and space exploration. Um, and Tesla Motor Company. We've got Commissioner, former Commissioner Mark Farron here, a happy Tesla customer. Um, Elon, po possibly most excitingly to me, is the man in my life that I'm likely to meet, most likely to get me to Mars. <laughs> to, uh, to Elon's right is President Mike Peavy. Mike Peavy is a man of many hats. He's a, he's a labor guy. He's an enviro. He's an entrepreneur himself. For the last more than 10 years, he's been the president of the Public Utilities Commission and been the man most singly responsible for reforming the energy industry in California with a lot of help in a lot of places, but possibly the most singly responsible for the, for the advances that the Public Utilities Commission in California have made in renewable energy and electric vehicles and a lot of the topics that we're going to be talking about today. Um, Mike is my boss, so I'm going to move on quickly there before I get into any trouble. And to Mike's immediate right is Lyndon Rive. Um, Lyndon is a, is a guy, I hope we're going to talk a little bit about some of the interesting features of Lyndon's life away from work. Lyndon is the driver of Solar City. 
uh, which is, I think, the largest provider of solar energy in the United States, is responsible for something like one-third of all the residential installations of uh, solar uh, in the United States. Think about that for a minute. About one-third of all the residential solar installations uh, Lyndon is, is personally responsible for. I've seen some YouTube videos uh, of you, Lyndon, from the last six or seven years. As you get younger and younger and better looking, the, the charts always keep on heading up, and it's an impressive thing. Uh, so those are our three panelists. Let me first invite uh, President Peavy to spend uh, three, three to seven minutes talking about this big subject that we're on today, and that's the intersection between innovation and regulation. Afternoon, Mike. Thank you very much, Paul, and it's, a, it's great to see this room absolutely filled and the spillover into our other uh, meeting rooms here and uh, all the others that are watching, and I hope that uh, this is a uh, rewarding uh, couple of hours for uh, all the uh, observers as well as uh, my colleagues here um, sitting beside me. The, the question of innovation and the impact of regulation, it, it can be a very complicated one. Through most of history, most of the time that we've had regulation, it's been a damper on innovation. I mean, the nature of regulation is to kind of dampen uh, innovation. I mean, what do, you, what do we regulate? The Public Utilities Commission historically regulated monopoly uh, utilities, telecom, water, and energy. And throughout much of, of that time, the energy sector was not known for uh, innovative policies. Uh, it did very little in the way of R&D. That was done by some, a group like EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute. Same in the area of telecom. Uh, it was a damper. And nationally, all this uh, was dramatized going back to the, all the way to President Carter's era when we had the, the uh, Civil Aeronautics Board that regulated the airlines or all kinds of uh, many, 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 many airlines, and, and believe it or not, Ted Kennedy and others combined finally got rid of that whole process and opened up competition, and probably more innovation came out of that. Uh, and then this became the buzzword in the UK. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, Lord Parkinson, uh, and others to break up the Central Electric Generating Board, all these different things that had, had been heavy-handed and try to introduce change and innovation into the energy sector. That came to this state. That, that uh, spread of that came to this state and we uh, tried uh, electric deregulation in California and uh, for a, a variety of reasons it was a crushing failure. And in fact we're still getting monies back from all those that uh, exploited a, a marketplace uh, for uh, built tens of billions of dollars, uh, and now the f 12 years after that happened, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is still in the throes of, of making decisions uh, to, to give that money back. In telecom, if it hadn't been for, originally for uh, uh, Judge Green, AT&T might still uh, be more or less, of course, under uh, its uh, more recent leadership, they've tried to reamalgamate AT&T back to where it was uh, in 1970. But the, uh, it would have, you would have had a, a similar situation. But uh, Judge Green broke up telecom. Uh, um, w there were some other players in it, but that was uh, basically went on and ushered in an incredible period of innovation in communications, of which we're still. Uh, you know, in, in, to some degree in the infancy. And it's, it's uh, overwhelming what goes on every day. Uh, if you're not reading about uh, uh, Tesla uh, in, in the battery business or in this business or SpaceX, you're reading about Comcast, you're reading about AT&T, you're reading about uh, uh, some other uh, uh, companies, uh, uh, Netflix, all these things came, they're all part of the communications sector today. They all came out of this uh, uh, um, change and, and innovation. When I came to this commission, uh, there was a instinctive reaction. I mean, regulators like to regulate. That's what they do. I mean, you're, you're most comfortable regulating. And uh, light-handed regulation was not something that was encouraged. In fact, uh, it was uh, viewed with a disfavor significantly. We managed to do that in the telecom sector in this state and you've seen a lot of innovation come about due to that. 
In the electric sector, when I came here, I was appointed by then Governor Gray Davis. Some of you may remember, or too many of you in the audience are too young to remember Gray Davis. Only me, only I can remember Gray Davis. But <laughs> he he asked me to do two things when he when he asked me to come on this commission in in early uh, 2002. One of them was make it greener which I think we've done in considerable uh, fashion. And, and the other was uh, to be, in effect, be a little more light-handed in terms of regulation. We have under, I have been committed to, to the latter course uh, all the time I've been here. And I think, and here's where I'm going to flip the whole issue from his regulation, a damper to, uh, on innovation, to can regulation positive regulation, and that's in the eye of the beholder, of course, what's positive, but can positive regulation uh, be an incentive, an inspiration to innovation? And I think the history of this California Public Utilities Commission over the past 10 to 12 years has been the latter, that we have been a, 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 a precursor, the sponsor of innovative policies across the board in the energy field. And I, in the interest of time, I'll only mention a few. We came up with a loading order. The loading order is just a nice way of saying priorities, and priorities were energy efficiency, number one, renewables, number two, and, and then uh, some conventional power plants and so forth. That was a, a big, big step at the time, and to endorse energy efficiency and to be willing to put significant amounts of money into energy efficiency was something that was looked upon, uh, you know, with disfavor by much of the corporate behemoths of California and anywhere else uh, at that time. You know, 10 years later, Chevron runs ads extolling energy uh, efficiency as number one in the priority list. That's something that, that to some degree has flown from their experiences. After all, they are a, a California head, headquartered corporation. We said we would uh, limit uh, by, by setting standards for um, power plants that have to, the power plant emissions have to be equal to a combined cycle gas turbine plant. That in effect closed the door to the importation of coal into California, a very innovative step in a way. We didn't say ban coal, we said you have to meet an emission standard of this type. I think that was very positive regulation. And then, you know, Go Governor Schwarzenegger came to this commission and asked me, after two years of trying to get his million solar roofs program adopted uh, by the legislature, can you do something at the Public Utilities Commission? I said, I'll get back to you in 90 days. We did, we, we did it, and then the legislature ratified it. That's exactly what happened. Uh, and the most recent the recent thing that we've done, again, in this, uh, and not so much in the energy space now, is we've endorsed all my colleagues collectively, a little misgivings at the start, but everybody came along, we endorsed the shared economy. We did that by creating something new that uh, uh, we called uh, transportation network uh, companies, a, a category that allows Uber, Sidecar, Lyft, and others to participate today with adequate consumer protections. Uh, insurance and all that as, as a part of a new wave of, of, of transportation, a new wave of, of, of people uh, getting around and interrelating and so forth. And now they they're get so innovative that last night if you got on at, uh, at, at Market and Beale Street and came up to Gulf Street in an Uber car at 6 p.m., you paid 60 bucks. They're doing time of day pricing now, which is a little steep, uh, and I'm not paying that again. <laughs> I'm back, on the I'm back on the Muni, I promise you. But Mike, it raises the obvious question, how do you know that? <laughs> because I was on the Uber. I was there. Anyway, anyway the, point, the point is, actually it was my daughter meeting me who was on Uber, meeting me at an excellent restaurant down the street here called Rich Table, I might add. But in any case, um, the, so you can, you can go either way of this. And, and I think in this state, with the, with, with the strong support of my colleagues, we have chosen a, a regulatory scheme that in the telecom area is light-handed and in the energy area is, to some degree is guided. I mean, the successes of companies like Solar City and all are a function of some of the public policies that set by this commission and other parts of state government, the California Energy Commission and elsewhere. So you can come out positively, you can come out negatively on this. Historically, regulation, dampen innovation. Today, at least in this state, I think we're trying to stimulate innovation, and I think there's some success stories that point the way to further to do that. 
Thank you very much. Elon, you've worked across a number of industries that are both incredibly innovative and also very closely regulated, at least in some aspects, financial services, automobiles, rocket ships. Um, <laughs> what, what about this intersection between innovation and regulation? Uh, well, I think, you know, particularly in case of, sorry, yeah, there you go. There we go. Um, but I think, in, in two, in cases where there are, uh, you know, monopoly providers or uh, duopoly providers, you know, where, where um, you know, it's, the, the, the free market can't uh, operate effectively, obviously utility being one, one of those things, you know, it's kind of it would be, um, unwieldy to have multiple uh, electricity lines going to, to every house and building, so it you know, sort of lends itself to monopoly, or at least historically has. Um, and so in order to avoid monopolies doing what monopolies tend to do uh, with respect to pricing, uh, that there's, there have to be regulations and to, to make sure that things are fair and reasonable. So, um, uh, and, and, and I think, I think um, the uh, regulators can, can therefore play a, an, an extremely important role in, uh, in, in the advent of sustainable energy um, uh, by ensuring that there is a, a means for people to establish um, solar on their roof uh, or to, to buy uh, wind um, and other renewables um, and, to, and so essentially to make sure that the right thing happens. Um, you know, in the absence of uh, firm action by the regulators, I think um, the right thing would not happen. So, uh, you know, I'm glad to see that that uh, in place. Um, uh, and I think that regulators serve a lot of, a lot of credit because they, they do face a, a huge amount of pressure from uh, these huge incumbent companies, um, and it's pretty hard to resist that, that pressure sometimes. So... Um, I think it's it's a it's a tough and, and often often thankless job, but uh, well, I'd like to say thank you now at least. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but you know, I think w w what we're facing here is uh, with with respect to, to to energy. I mean, just to sort of look at it from from a high level, is it, it is very important for us to move to clean, sustainable energy, um, and the sooner we do that, the better off the world is, um, and. Um, but but it, it is going to be some amount of strife for the existing utilities and, and particularly the ones that, that are sort of heavy into um, uh, fossil fuels and that kind of thing. Um, so there, it is going to be a bit of a hardship for them, but, but there's no choice. We've, we've, like, we've either got to decide that we're going to go towards clean, sustainable energy or not. And, and, and if we decide, okay, yeah, we, we want a good future, because the only good future is when we have sustainable energy, um, then we've got to make the hard decisions that are necessary to achieve that objective. Um, and um, you know, from, the, from the standpoint of, say, SolarCity and, and Tesla, you know, SolarCity is obviously trying, trying its best to uh, lower the cost of uh, solar power. So if somebody wants to put solar power in their home or business, uh, obviously it's got to be affordable, it's got to be competitive. Um, and it's a, it's a it's quite a, a tough job just getting all of the the costs associated with um, uh, you know getting getting a customer on board and designing a solar system for a roof and installing it uh, and you know it's all the installation hardware and the uh, the wiring and the inverter um, and the after sales service and the permitting um, and a lot of it is kind of uh, boring and kind of unglamorous stuff but it's got to be done. Um, <clears throat> And I uh, think like Lyndon and the team at Solar City are doing, doing an amazing job at that. Um, and uh, and then there's this you know this question of storage that that's important because obviously the sun only shines for part of the day, um, and we need electricity all of the day, <laughs> um, all of the and night. Um, so that's what you know storage is pretty important for that. It's also important for just regulating. Um, Power production through the grid, so you don't you can minimize sort of the spikes that occur at, at various times a day. So we're working at at Tesla to create um, stationary uh, battery packs uh, that that also the, the cost is a super important, but they've also got to last long. They've got to be super safe. They need to be quite compact, which which is important, particularly for houses. 
Um, you know, if somebody's, somebody doesn't have like a whole room to put a giant battery pack in, <laughs> you know, it's like, what happened to your guest bedroom? Well, it's got a battery pack in it right now, and that's not going to work. Um, so, uh, so it's got to be something that's really compact. Um, that you can sort of like mount flush up against the wall, maybe only um, sticks out like three or four inches, you know, in, in your garage or something like that, and, uh, and that you don't even notice it's there. Like that's the ideal kind of uh, stationary storage pack that you'd want. Um, and then on the roof, you want to make the solar panels as, as, as aesthetically appealing as possible. I mean, the ideal scenario, the, the solar system actually makes the roof look better. Um, and, um, you know, I think that's like a, like a scenario that I think would, would really work and would scale uh, to, to a very huge degree. Um, so that's, that's what we're working towards. Thanks. Thank you, Elon. Lyndon, you've been, uh, I, was, I was about to say, on the ground floor of the change in the energy economy. I guess I should say the rooftop um, of the change in the energy economy, which means that you've been involved in a lot of the, what, what Elon describes as sort of the unglamorous but necessary work of getting the commercial agreements worked out and the, ma and the manufacturing and the quality control, getting the customers educated, getting the utilities calmed down. Um, uh, you've been at this now for a number of years. What have you learned about regulation, about its impact on the innovation you've been trying to do? Yeah, I, I have a deep appreciation for the importance of regulation since, uh, since getting into this business, um, uh, more, more than I, I, I expected. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you want to just stop there? Is that yeah? <laughs> the, um, but, but regulation is, is so broad, and I, I was thinking about it before this, the, the, this panel. You know, re regulation has so many important things that it covers, but, but what's one big thing that, that it has to, has to address? And, and that is a market failure. This is a big time for regulation to step in if there's a specific market failure. And uh, climate change today is, is a market failure. We've essentially put our, uh, the cost of burning fossil fuels externally, and there, there's a market failure that's occurring. And so this is where regulation has to step in to, to, to address this, this issue. Um, California has been, done a great job. As President PV has mentioned earlier, there was a million home initiative. Uh, it, it really has uh, helped put the entire U.S. on the map for renewable energy. Uh, uh, Solar City itself has a million customer goal. In, it was a five-year goal, now it's four and a half years. Um, so it, it's... California is really uh, leading this, this space. But in order to have regulation make changes, <coughs> that they, they need alternatives. And this is where the innovation comes in. Because you can't just, OK, if the existing problem is broken, fix that. You have to allow innovation to occur to fix the problem. And if you put an end goal in place, then everybody can create innovate, and you put a system in place, with the regulators put a system in place where you can allow competition, which is the primary uh, cause of innovation. If you didn't have competition, would you think you have to create a better phone? Would you think you need to create a faster car or a more comfortable car? Would you do anything better if it was just good enough? So this is the, the importance of regulation. Allow competition, allow innovation. You have an end goal and that is to decarbonize the energy infrastructure. It, it, it removes the debates, it removes the hurdles, everybody goes towards that goal, and then innovation will occur. Part of this change, it actually will help the economy. So you provide a lower cost uh, energy to the consumer that is clean. During this transition, you employ thousands of jobs so just Solar City itself, we have 5,000 employees. Actually, Monday we'll hit 5,000, like 4,900 and something. Uh, but Monday we hit 5,000 mark, um, uh, of which half of them are in California, a little less than half, but about half of them in California. So the innovation is occurring, the technology is here, uh, with the single focus providing cheaper, cleaner energy. So, so all, the, all the solutions are possible. We know it's there. So then you, then you fast forward and you go, okay, if 30 years from now, if, if we have a heart-to-heart -heart with our kids who's highly educated at the point, and they go, okay, let me get this straight. You knew there's a problem in climate change. No debate. You absolutely knew there's a problem in climate change. You knew you had to fix it. You created a solution. 
and, and you started deploying the technology. You saw it in practice and saw that it works really well. And then you decided to cap it? What? Why? So I think that's the, that's the, the part that we have to look at. It's, we have to decarbonize our energy infrastructure. In this, how do we do it? How do we bring innovation and competition? Or actually, how do you bring competition, which will then drive innovation? Thanks. Lennon, thank you. So I want to focus in, uh, there, there are lots of innovations that are needed to accomplish decarbonizing the, the energy infrastructure of the world. I want to focus in on one that Elon, on one that Elon mentioned, and that's storage. Elon, you're often asked, because of your level of success across multiple industries, what's the secret sauce? I hope, by the way, you'll actually reveal that to me privately <laughs> later. Um, and I've heard you uh, answer in a very interesting way, and that is to encourage people, I think the way you describe it is, don't reason from analogy, reason from the physics of the situation. Right. Go back to first principles and build your solution, build your innovation from that. Let me invite you to walk us through, let's take storage as an example, or another one if you should choose that, and just walk me through how you do that. What are the, what are the physics of storage over the next five or 10 years uh, in a regulated realm that you want regulators and people interested in regulation to hear about? Um, okay. <laughs> Um, and, you know, you have 90 seconds, 89, <laughs> yeah. 88. Right, right, exactly. Uh, let's see. Um, well, I mean, so we, we know what the uh, energy density is of uh, current production lithium-ion cells. And, you know, we know a lot about their, uh, how, their current life and their si the cycle life. Um, and it's, you know, so it's, so sort of at around 260 watt hours per kilogram. Um, we also know what the, the price is uh, of, the, of the cell. Um, we know what the price of the cell is as made by, say, Panasonic, uh, our main supplier. Um, a, but battery, the, a battery cell. Yeah, the battery cell. Um, but there's another way to look at the, the, what the cost of the cell, which is to say, OK, what are, the, um, what are the constituents of the cell? And if you were to buy those raw materials on, say, the London Metal Exchange, the international commodity markets, um, and had a magic wand and could sort of reassemble those raw materials into a cell form, that tells you asymptotically what the, the true cost of energy storage can be. Um, it seems like a pretty obvious thing to do. Um, and so the primary constituents of our cell right now, the number one is uh, nickel. Uh, nickel is a very common metal. It's used in stainless steel and a bunch of other things. Uh, cobalt. Uh, aluminum, uh, and then on the uh, anode side, it is carbon, which is actually made from a little bit of coal. <laughs> uh, uh, but only a little. We don't really use, just, we don't really just, use just that word dash. in this room. Yeah. <laughs> just, just a dash. Um, and a uh, tiny bit of it. And um, so that stuff's all, and, and, then the, and then the can itself is, is a stainless steel can. Um, and this stuff's all pretty you know, obvious uh, to price. Um, and if you actually look at, say, okay, what's the pr price for materials? It's, um, you know, it's it, it, it's substantially below $100 a kilowatt hour uh, at the cell level. Substantially below it. So, you know, maybe sort of 60 or 70 or something like that. Um, and 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 we know it's possible to uh, get more energy per unit mass over time. So there, are, I mean, there are things that there, there are better cells than the cell we currently have that are working and have been cycled a lot. Um, so therefore, uh, if you were to scale up simply the existing chemistry that we have um, and to vertically integrate it so that you could reduce the logistics costs and, um, you know, and, and, uh, and just make it a lot more sort of efficient um, and, and have better economies of scale, um, you can get way closer to the uh, raw material cost than we currently are at. Um, so that's like what I mean by first principles. You can say, oh, okay, that's, that's, where, that's what's possible, and then you've got to figure out, okay, how do you get there? Um, and let me take it from there. I want, I want at this stage to recognize sitting in the front here Commissioner Carla Peterman, uh, who's uh, recently confirmed by the State Senate to her term here on the commission and has been the lead commissioner on the PUC's storage proceeding, which just set a very ambitious uh, 1,200 megawatt goal for storage. Uh, and so with the, with the first principles, with the physics of the situation that we just heard from Elon, uh, Mike Peavy, let me turn it to you. So uh, what does the regulator do 
Uh, so there are, there are price and efficiency benefits to be gained in storage. We know that storage is an important part of decarbonizing the future. What should the regulator be doing uh, to not to dampen innovation but to inspire it? Well, I think we did it. Ms. Peterman, <laughs> you want to stand and think about? <laughs> I mean, actually, it was 1,350 megawatts, I think, was the, is the goal for, the, for this decade, which is, a, uh, I hope, turns out to be a de minimis goal. Uh, truly, uh, the, uh, we have to do, I mean, here's a perfect, another perfect example of regulation acting in a very positive way, stimulating a new market that was Creep coming along, but coming along uh, at a slower pace, and then we've, we're incentivizing that market in California. But the market was coming along on its own. I mean, I mentioned today that at this morning's meeting uh, being uh, on Maui a couple of weeks ago and how much wind there is on Maui and how it's backed up with a very significant storage system. But, I mean, the future is all the things you're going to be able to do with electric vehicles and all, and all the other things that uh, make storage such an uh, essential part. And I think that you'll find that this commission will, will, will uh, develop and adopt policies consistent with the, the fastest spread of this technology that can be done. I yeah. can't speak for other states. I can only speak for California, but I think we'll do that. So, Lyndon, there you've heard it. We've got the basic physics. They're all lined up. The regulator has done, apparently, everything we need to do. So where's our storage? Uh -huh. uh, actually, a very good point. Um, I have some on that. The, there's no doubt that the technology uh, will get there. There's no doubt that it, uh, storage will be cost-effective combined with solar and deliver electricity at night. There's no doubt it will get there. But we all know that is the game-changing product. That is the game-changing product. So the challenge that you have when you have the game-changing product and the technology is approaching, those in the game don't want to change the game. They, they really like the existing game. The existing game is sole source, cost plus model. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a really good game. So where regulation can really help when, when uh, inspiring innovation is to not only look at the innovation itself, but look at the entire process that the innovation gets applied and that the constraints of the application of the innovation is not constrained. A simple example would be, California came up with this great S-chip program to, to allow storage. It's awesome, it's great. And that's, it's, the, and that's, the, and that's the self-generation incentive program, SGIP. And um, so we, we've, we've had uh, hundreds of customers apply to this uh, we're deploying the batteries, they're on our customers, they're on the walls, they can't connect. So it's taking, on average, about eight months to get them to connect. There's no reason. I mean, the, when the person arrives to get connected, they do nothing but just check and say, yes, it's on. It's really, really basic. If the utility does not have the resource, maybe outsource it to a third party, it's, it's simple to fix. But you can't help yourself think that the reason why it's slow is the behavior incentive is not to change the game. So the way you don't change the game is you delay the game from changing. So that's a really key place where uh, regulation can get in, uh, create the innovation, and make sure that the roadblocks aren't intentionally put there to prevent the adoption of that innovation. Is, there, is the average waste eight months? Yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty bad. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think, why? I, I think you uh, uh, take some comfort that after today it'll come down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a meta look at the discussion that we just had. So. Uh, so we went from physics to regulatory policy to on the ground. That's all great. It's taken eight months even to get my phone call answered. Um, what are the mechanisms, and, and Mike Peavy, I turn to you here. Uh, what are the mechanisms within government, among the regulators, that regulators need to be thinking about that we're not thinking about now, about how to solve these problems? You've now had the experience for 10 years coming in from outside government and running a powerful government agency with many successes and I think you'd agree some failures. Uh, in getting programs to happen. What does the grizzled, experienced, 11-year President Mike Peavy say to the brand new um, President Mike Peavy 11 years ago that you should be out talking to regulators and legislators about the one habit of mind that they should form uh, to, to eliminate that problem that Lyndon just put on the table? 
Well, I mean, this is the problem that Lyndon has described is it's so basic to change in every venue all the time, right? I mean, I, I, I have to laugh when I think back that, uh, that in uh, 15 years ago, I created a company called New Energy Ventures, which we ended up selling to AES and now Constellation Energy. And we went through, the, we, we put in <coughs> new meters, we put in meters for all our commercial customers. And the utilities would not come out and disconnect the old meter and put it and attach the new meter. It was the same game. They were called DAZRs, direct access service requests, and they would just stall and stall and stall. Classic was, was the Macy's store here in San Francisco. If you know the Macy's store, it over time has grown from, from just being an O'Farrell and Stockton to now have an opening on Geary Street and so forth. There were three different meters serving that, uh, that store because of just historically. We can never get the uh, incumbent utility who will remain nameless to send somebody out there to take out these meters. You know, I mean, it went on and on and on. Anyway, we ended up threatening with a lawsuit and things changed. But the, uh, uh, it's, it's, the, it's, it's just a, a natural thing. But uh, in every venue, everywhere, so uh, whether it's landing slots at LaGuardia Airport or this or whatever, the, the, uh, you're always going to have this kind of resistance from the incumbents. And it's a, motivated by economics, and you can understand it. And, uh, you know, where you stand on a lot of these issues depends on where you sit, and where you sit depends on what the income stream is. So, I mean, you know, the, the, there, there you are. Now, the, for, for me, looking back on this, I, I, I only wish that, that um, I mean, because Paul, Paul's right, we did have some frustrations. I, we, I got this commission, uh, uh, we, we voted to create a climate institute at the University of California, spend $60 million a year in research and everything else. The legislature thwarted it. Uh, because it wasn't, quote, their program. I, looking back, I wish I'd spent more time courting the legislature. That's not an easy thing to do, since if I had my way, I wouldn't have a legislature. But, uh... <laughs> you're, you're aware your microphone is on, right? <laughs> and, it's, <laughs> right. And, it's, and it's those kind of comments that have got me into trouble in the other area. But, uh, uh, but spending more time trying to be more inclusive in trying to bring every, all the parties to the, all the, the participants at the party along at more or less the same pace together. But you know, when you're, when you're running fast, like these two gentlemen on my left and right are, you don't have time to go courting all those parties. You're just, I mean, your own patience is, you know, you want to get ahead, get, a, get ahead, get ahead. And I, I shared uh, some of that, and that's called frustration and, and, and lack of, of tolerance for the status quo. But uh, as I look back, and I have a little more gray hair than either one of them, although they'll get there in time, um, the, I, I think that a, a little bit more uh, foreplay or romance, if you will, uh, would, <laughs> okay, would, again, would have been better. On. <laughs> I, I really appreciate that advice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Elon, I hesitate to ask you to react to what you just heard, but... I will invite you to do it's that. All very and, innocent. <laughs> I'll invite you to, to, to tell us what you're thinking now, and especially I'm interested in your experience of having worked not just with economic regulators, but with financial regulators, safety regulators, lots of, of folks in a, in when you've been doing innovations. Who does it well? Who does it the best? And what's different about them? Sorry, I'm, I'm just, my mind's reeling just from the... <laughs> 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 Full play and utilities. Um, well, um, go see the Wolf on Wall Street. <laughs> yeah. I, um, actually, you know what's great is the Lego Movie. <laughs> I really, I really like the Lego Movie. It's really great. Um, okay. I know what the headline tomorrow is now going to be. Everything is awesome. <laughs> um, so let's see. In terms of regulation, um, well, yeah, I do, I do think. Um, on, on, uh, I mean, you know, no, at least n nobody's perfect, no institution is perfect. Uh, I think, on balance, California is doing a pretty good job on the regulatory front. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some, some battles we've got to figure out, like, you know, how to have it not take eight months to just get somebody's, you know, battery pack connected. Um, but, uh, but overall, pretty good. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think, like, uh, you know, I think. I mean, I think generally in, in the U.S., uh, I think our regulatory body is pretty good. 
Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think like. <laughs> uh, let's talk about uh, Mars. Okay. <laughs> uh, let me point you in a slightly different direction. So. Um, a, a lot of what you're doing now is innovating in spaces where there, have, there are very long-term incumbents, the automobile industry, uh, the space industry, if that's a term you can use about space. Uh, what made you think those areas were ripe for innovation, and what the heck makes you think you, you can be successful competing against all the expertise in the world? Well, I, I definitely wouldn't compete against all the expertise in the world, uh, but, it's, but it, it would be, uh, I mean, in the case of... Uh, Solar City and Tesla, it's really about trying to solve the sustainable energy problem. Um, and, you know, we it just obviously, if, I mean, the way, the way I approach things like sort of look, you know, think about the future and try to envision the future and um, what, what has, you know, what, what could have a really negative effect on, on that outcome and what, what's really, what do we really need to solve in order for it to be a positive future, you know, one where we can be sort of optimistic and inspired about the future. And uh, if we don't have sustainable energy, obviously we're we're screwed. Um, so e even if the even if there weren't environmental um, uh, damage occurring, if, if if the if the energy is not sustainable, if it's not renewable, then we'll run out of it. Like we'll eventually run out of stuff to mine and burn. Um, and uh, and actually, it's kind of crazy that we're like we're burning things like oil because. You know, that that has much higher value in say the plastics industry or something, oh, and so it's like burning the, the furniture in your house, you know, instead of firewood. Um, so I uh, anyway, so, so so my motivation for Tesla and, and Tulsa was just try to try to do something in sustainable power generation and sustainable power consumption, and um, I, I didn't think I thought Tesla at the beginning I thought we would probably fail. Uh, although I should say, at the beginning of Seoul City, I, I thought Seoul City would probably succeed. Um, <laughs> I've got a lot of faith in Lennon and the rest of the team. Um, and uh, I also thought SpaceX would fail. So it's kind of surprising to me that uh, they're all... <laughs> <laughs> they didn't, didn't fail yet. So what was it about the two? So why did you think uh, the automobile and the space industry were the ones where, where, where failure would happen and, uh, and Solar City is where success would happen? Well, I thought the, uh, when I started SpaceX, I didn't know anything about um, aerospace really. I had a sort of physics background, but I didn't really know how to build rockets or build anything really, uh, uh, any, any kind of physical object. So uh, I thought it would, that seemed like it would be very unlikely to succeed. And, and in fact, you know, the first three launches of SpaceX didn't succeed. So this was not like a totally crazy <laughs> <laughs> position to take. Um, and and in the beginning of SpaceX, I really just reserved money for, th for three, three failures. So we never had three failures. <laughs> um, and then we just barely had enough to scrape together to do a, f a fourth flight. Unfortunately, that succeeded. But it was a real close call. Uh, if that fourth flight hadn't succeeded, it would have been game over there. Uh, you know, with Tesla, we had multiple near-death near experiences. Uh, again, you know, what, what are the odds of a car company succeeding? Um, I think pretty, pretty darn low. Uh, and in fact, at Tesla, we came within a few days of being bankrupt. Uh, you know, and we, we closed the, the the financing round at the end of 2008 on the last hour of the last day that it was possible to do that, which was like basically uh, 6 p.m. Christmas Eve 2008. And we would have gone bankrupt a few days after Christmas. So, um, you know, these are real close calls, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Lyndon, what's the, what's the close call 10 years from now that we need to worry about? Let's say that everything that's on your mind now as a barrier has been solved. We've, we've got the regulatory structures in place, the consumers are educated, the market is being served. What's the next generation of challenges that regulators and legislatures, which don't move quickly, need to be thinking about now? You know, it's, it's funny. I, I, I really don't think we're going to have a problem 10 years from now. At that point... It's everybody agrees, decarbonize the infrastructure. So everybody's marching towards that. I think the biggest challenge we have is the next five years. So, so this is the, getting everybody into that camp that we're all solving that problem is, is just gonna take a little momentum. Um, uh, I was actually speaking to a, a large uh, utility in Europe just, just, just recently, and 
they, they had a similar approach. So, yeah, the first, first phase, they, they resisted the first phase. And now um, Germany specifically has about a 5% penetration uh, of, of solar. And they've, no, it is happening. Let's get on board. Let's create a business model that solves this problem. So then everybody starts collaborating and solving the problem versus putting up these roadblocks uh, uh, that doesn't solve the problem. So uh, I'd say over the next five years in the US, there will be these roadblocks that prevent the problem being solved. And then at over five, maybe eight years, then it's going to be, okay, the problem is getting solved. Business models, innovative business models will get created to address this problem, and we'll start transforming the way energy is delivered. Let me, Paul, let me just say a couple things about this question. You have to have the right policy construct, and California has the right policy construct. It's fundamental, and it, you have to give uh, whatever his other foibles may be, and Schwarzenegger a tremendous amount of credit for executive order that set up reducing greenhouse gases by 2050 uh, by 90 percent or so over what they were in 1990. Governor Brown, Jerry Brown came in second time around. He reinforced those, that decision by Schwarzenegger, adopted strongly the cap and trade program which started and we're on it and is absolutely as a leader, the executive leader of the state of California committed to rapid greenhouse gas reduction, rapid increase in solar energy, rapid increase in electric vehicles and all other non-polluting forms. And without him, it would, uh, the rest of us would have a very difficult time. First Schwarzenegger, now even in more pronounced fashion, uh, Jerry Brown. And all of us who are appointed by Brown understand that and articulate, uh, do our best to articulate and carry out those policies and practices as, as fact. And uh, that, it, had a, it started at the top, and all of us uh, feel this state can be a beacon for this world. That's what it, the real game here is. We're one to two percent of carbon emissions in the whole world. It's what the state can do to show leadership and the relations we have with China and elsewhere that can further enhance that policy perspective and thrust <coughs> that will have ultimately a more dramatic impact on the portions of the United States that are heretofore are still back in the 60s and 70s in terms of mentality. Mike may just have given his closing remarks. I'm, uh, we're, we're moving closer to uh, the audience-driven, uh, the Q&A portion of the agenda. So as we come to the end of the discussion among the panelists here, I want to bring it back to what we started with, which is the topic, the innovation, innovation and the impact of regulation and the nexus there. So we started out with some thoughts. We've had some discussions about individual barriers and individual experiences about that. I'd like to invite each of the panelists, and Lyndon, I'm going to start with you, and then we'll, we'll come to Elon, and then, uh, and then President Peavy. So after this discussion, I'd like to hear three or four sentences of, okay, what's your conclusion? What conclusion do we want the folks here to hear about the, the, what are the takeaways about innovation and the impact of regulation? And with, with all due respect to Elon's hatred of, an, of analogy, I'm going to say that, uh, that if you're able to work in underwater hockey as an analogy, uh, you'll get a lot of extra points from me. <laughs> well, um, working with this, uh, this business, I've learned how to hold my breath. Is that good? <laughs> Hi, that was pretty good. Hi, was, how many people here know there's such a thing as underwater hockey? All right, so first you have, first you have to say what it is, Lyndon. Oh, really? Okay. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's a game. You play ice hockey, the ice melts, you just keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, really, it's the uh, it's your mask, phones, snorkel. There's a team in San Francisco, one-handed stick, uh, lead puck made it, uh, at the bottom. Hold your breath, go down, play as long as you can before you run out of air. Give the puck to your buddy, get up some air, and you do that for 30 minutes. A lot of fun. Okay, uh, I, I want to point out that's what he does for relaxation. So, so uh, actually, actually, back to, uh, to uh, now nah, I forgot what your question was. <laughs> the regulators uh, set the rule book for the sport. Uh, what, what role does the rule book play uh, in innovation? What's your, what's your conclusion? What's the takeaway? Oh, okay. Actually, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine the, the job of, a, of uh, the complexity of the regulator ha has to face, but what I do know that in terms of energy, this is probably the most exciting time for, for any regulator to be in the space. I, I, it's 
everything is coming together, innovation is coming together, technology is com coming down to a point where you can actually change. We don't have to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. It, it's, it will create the same result if you keep on burning fossil fuel. So now it's, it's uh, very important to look at the innovation that's occurring and, see, and allow the adoption to occur, apply it, remove the constraints, and then address the incumbents. So what we don't want to have happen, because this is when it can get really, really painful. The innovation continues. The energy infrastructure starts adopting the new innovation. And then the old business model still continues. What happens is you build out, you build out even further two energy infrastructures. At some point, <coughs> someone has to shut down. And if you fast forward 10, 20 years, I don't think you're going to be shutting down the clean, cheap energy. You're going to be shutting down the fossil fuel-based energy. So the best thing to do is to know that both infrastructures are going to get built, look at it and go, do we need to build this? Can we use technology and innovation to have a transition that occurs? Add storage, add solar. So you don't build out two infrastructures. So I think that's, that's, the, that's the challenge that, uh, and going to be the fun, uh, excitement for, for, for regulators. I, I agree with, the, with everything you just said. Uh, the only thing I, I would add here is, I mean, for us as regulators, is to try to create and induce and create and, uh, and see <coughs> manifested this uh, innovative culture uh, again and again and again. And it's happening all the time. And I, I'm not so worried about those two going at lockstep together up like that because it'll be like, you know, in, in 1902, people were talking about what's going to happen to the buggy whip manufacturer and what's going to happen to this and that. And they all finally, then they just, they just drop off and, and the other grows. And what's happening in this energy sector is the players are, there are just so many new players now, you can't keep track of it all. And, and I mean, when you see Google buying Next so that they could have another avenue into the home <laughs> and offer services heretofore not even imagined a few years ago and not imagined probably by any of the, the investor-owned utilities today, and Google investing in this and investing in, in solar power towers and everything else. I mean, think of all the new entrants and, and what dynamism and creativity that, that, that represents. And what we have to do while understanding that we have to protect consumers in this process is not impede that, but promote it. Elon, what's the takeaway on, on innovation and regulation, the role of the rule book in innovating? Well, I think the, the rules need to be set such that um, they maximize the innovation uh, ultimately for the benefit of the, uh, the consumer um, or you know, the uh, citizen of the country. Um, so, uh, and, and, and really, to, I think they need to be to, towards the long-term benefit, not, not just the short-term stuff. Um, and I think those, those rules are all the difference. Um, that you know, the, the, the right rules will ensure that we move quickly towards a sustainable future and the wrong ones will ensure that we do not. So. I think that's a great way to bring this, this uh, portion of the afternoon together. While we get the uh, microphone uh, holders ready to go, let me invite the audience to join me in a round of applause for our three panelists. <laughs> Lyndon Rive of Solar City, President Michael Peavy of the California Public Utilities Commission, and Elon Musk of many things. Uh, let's see, we have, uh, which side would you like to go to first? Well, I, I've already sold the first question. All right. So I'm gonna go, to, <laughs> I have not sold the first question. <laughs> oh, sure. Hi, uh, my name is Jamie Chang. I'm a Solar City customer and hopefully a future Tesla customer. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Uh, my question is for Elon, and this week there was a Morgan Stanley analyst that talked about uh, or set a bold future uh, utopian society that's only 12 years away. I'm curious what you think about, or if you could share your vision about how you think about autonomous vehicles and how they'll change the way we travel. Um, well, I think it'll be a long time before we get to true autonomous vehicles, um, and I think what we'll have is actually um, something that 
what we, we call sort of autopilot, you know, similar to what you have in an aircraft, um, where you still have a, a driver, but you massively reduce driver workload, uh, and effectively improve safety, and just make it easier to go from one place to another. Um, and you know, I, th I think we'll have some pretty exciting things in terms of the um, of, of autopilot capability in the next couple of years from, from Tesla, um, and um, and we'll keep refining it and refining it and making it better over time. But um, but I think I think we'll need drivers just as we have pilots uh, for for quite a long time into the future. Sure. I'm Danielle Murray. I'm from the San Francisco Department of Environment. For one more day. Um, so a present, uh, question for President Peavy. We hear a lot about how, sorry about that, how the um, electric utility industry needs to change if they want to maintain their business. Um, but how can the, how can we increase the speed of regulatory innovation to, to match that? Well, first place, uh, the premise I think is a little off there. It's, they, they, they don't have to change to maintain their business. Their business is changing. The fund, their fundamental business is changing. And uh, I think the nexus between the, the, uh, an, an energy utility, uh, particularly electric side, because this is much slower on the gas side, uh, is, uh, is inexorably changing at a pace faster than, than we would have seen a, a few years ago or anticipated. Uh, Solar City is just one example of that. I, I think that, that we are doing an awful lot to stimulate uh, or accept that change, and the, and those companies will become, and they'll still be very profitable. Remember, they're they're great cash cows. There's a lot of money, a uh, billion a year plus in, in earnings uh, that uh, companies like PG&E and Edison and Semper and all uh, make. They'll become wires companies uh, for a, quite a quite a while until ultimately that is diminished by storage. But there'll still be a significant. Uh, need for, for wires. And now they have a lot of money to invest in other things. So companies like Edison now are investing in solar companies, and so is PG&E, and so forth. The race goes to the swift and to the clever, and, and the people that guide those companies that have those resources that Elon wishes he had in 19, in two, 2008, just a, a, you know, $50 million, that's something in fusion at that time would have made all the difference in the world as yeah, Christmas Eve came around. I mean, they have that money to, to exploit and invest, and if they're smart and clever, I think they, they, they have a very secure future. But it's not the same business as they have today or had 10 years ago, because it's direct access, which is a, a different f form of competition, change that to begin with. Community choice aggregation, like in Marin County and soon Sonoma County, is also changing that business model. It's, it's not solely technological innovation that's changing, it's institutional innovation too. And how well you manage the technological and institutional innovation will determine how well you succeed as, as, a, as what we today call utilities of the future, in my view. Hi, I'm Tobias Kemper from Deutsche Telekom. My question is for Elon. Um, you have taken known solutions to problems that seemingly only governments could implement, and in this case, uh, build your own power grid for electric vehicles. I'm curious, given the fact that we know how to produce fully sustainable products, like your Coke bottle there, or plastic <laughs> bottle, how would you approach the implementation to accelerate those solutions? Um, <clears throat> the implementation of essentially of, of, of sustainable power and, and, and uh, generation and, and, and vehicle driving. So how, what, what, what so let's make sure we get you on the mic yeah. so the folks can given hear. That we know how you, to produce this um, Coke light plastic bottle out of fully sustainable materials in a fully sustainable way. How would you use your expertise to accelerate the implementation of those methods? Of, of uh, you of mean, of power generation? Or, or do you mean, of Coke across, bottles? Across the, across uh, I don't know about Coke bottles. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't have a ton of ex expertise on Coke bottles, honestly. The, um, yeah. It could be uh, any product. So uh, basically okay. moving from, moving on from recycling and doing less bad to doing something beneficial. And fully sustainable. Um, I, I'm not quite sure how to answer your question. 
Um, yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I, th I, I wouldn't worry too much about, like, like um, you know, uh, like garbage, you know, it, like, like this, this, you know, this recycling of garbage and, and stuff like that, of various types of garbage, that, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's, not, it's, that's important, but it's, it pales in significance to uh, having um, sustainable, clean power generation and, and consumption. Uh, you know, um, the, 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 the world's not going to die because of Coke bottles, but, it, you know, it, it you know, could, could because of, of, of if we destroy the climate, you know. So uh, we, we've, got to, um, we've got to prioritize sustainable power generation. That that's and, and, and consumption, obviously. Um, that that's the thing that if, if if we if we don't solve it, I, I mean, it will be extremely dire for um, life as we know it. Well, c can I just add a word to that? I I think that I and mean, this doesn't answer the question entirely, but I think that the development which we've done in California and the U the <coughs> European Union has of a cap and trade program that progressively lowers the the cap will force all industries, including that that makes this bottle, into more efficient, more sustainable products. And that is, I think that is the answer. Now, some of these products are far more significant than others. Whether, whether this endures for 50 years as a plastic bottle is, uh, is, is a lot different than whether you know, coal is gone. There's no question about that. But, but the, the central policy thrust of, a, of cap and trade or carbon taxes or whatever that ratchets down constantly will force innovation and stimulation of better products and more sustainable products over time, in my view. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, my name is uh, David Fan. Uh, the question is for, for Elon. Elon, earlier in the talk, you, you, um, you mentioned how to drive down uh, the cost of batteries. So my question would be maybe uh, for the Model S, for, for its battery, say three, four years from now, how, 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 by percentage, what are you going to be able to drive it down to approximately, say, f three, four years from now? Well, and if you can relate that to state worker salaries, that would be <laughs> <there>. <laughs> yeah. um, So uh, for, for our vehicle after the Model X, we're aiming to produce a, a smaller car in the Model S, like maybe 20% smaller, but it'll be probably half the cost, so around $35,000 with a 200-mile a, a uh, usable range minimum. Uh, that that's our goal. About the battery in particular. Yeah. So, well, in order to achieve that, you've got to reduce the cost of the battery. Um, since the car is twenty percent smaller, uh, you, you, the, the pack would therefore be twenty percent smaller. Um, but we've got to get to a, in, in total a fifty percent cost reduction. So that means that at the cost of the pack and you know, there's the car has to drop by another thirty percent, um, which I believe we can do with economies of scale. Uh, vertical integration and design innovation. Hi, uh, the, um, my name is Administrative <coughs> Law Judge Catherine McDonald, and uh, my question is actually for our President PV. Um, we've been talking about innovation uh, and the impact uh, of regulation. My question is, how do we stimulate and encourage innovation within our own walls um, to approach problems and solutions in a, in a new way? That's a little, you know, that's probably too much inside baseball for most people in this room. Uh, but uh, certainly reforming our civil service practices would take us a major step in that direction. You know, I mean, we are so encumbered uh, internally in our operations, rules, regulations, procedures, and everything else, some statutorily imposed, others imposed by ourselves, on, upon ourselves, all in the name of, of this good or that good. And I think that, that uh, we can do with a um, significant <coughs> amount less of that uh, in, all, in all candor. The biggest, the biggest uh, um, change for me in some ways from uh, being in the private sector uh, to coming into the Public Utilities Commission was how little freedom of action I truly had, particularly when it came to personnel <coughs> matters and other things, that all the strictures were so, were so limiting and so frustrating that I would, you know, say to Clannon, what in the hell's wrong here? 
you know, kind of thing. I mean, it's uh, why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? And, and are and you claiming that's in the past tense? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, no, on that point, no. But I mean, and and so it's it, this is a problem separate from the topic uh, that we're talking about here. But it's an inherent, I think, an inherent problem of uh, of the functionality of government. In all, in all honesty, whether it's at the local level, the state level, or the federal level, is that we we have become so encrusted with rules, procedures, and regulations that the freedom of action and innovation is very, very difficult. To some degree, you have more innovation and freedom of action and all in the military than you do in the non-military sector of, of, of all our lives. And I think that's a very interesting comment for those of us that are kind of took a dim view of the military for much of our lives. Hi, Ethan Elkind. I'm with UC Berkeley School of Law and I work on uh, climate change policy. I had a question about the battery packs in vehicles once they no longer have enough capacity for driving and wondering if there's thought about what's going to happen when we have tens of thousands, if not millions of battery packs that uh, are done with their primary use but could potentially have value as a secondary use. So wondering if there's been thought given to that, uh, I guess probably for you, Elon, but also, Lyndon, if uh, Solar City's thought about uh, entering that kind of market or, or thinking about how to enter that market. Lyndon, why don't you take the first stab at that? The, uh, it hasn't, I mean, absolutely there'll be a second application. Um, uh, right now it hasn't been a, a strong focus on, on, on the company directly as all the batteries are, are, are relatively new. Uh, but as soon as it does there, I mean, it, it's, it, if there is life in it, it's a great application to add it to solar. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're expecting sort of the, the battery used to be sort of in the 8 to 12 year time frame. So as Lynn was saying, um, since we, we don't really actually have any production cars older than eight years, uh, there's not a lot of batteries yet for reuse. But it, it would definitely be uh, the smart move to take batteries that are maybe at, say, 60% capacity um, and um, it's, it, you know, too, too low to be convenient in the car, but still great for stationary storage. Uh, they'll have a greater economic value uh, as, as stationary storage um, rather than recycling. Uh, but you know, all, all the packs either will get used in stationary storage uh, or recycled, and then certainly when they do eventually reach end of life, we'll, we'll go through uh, re recycling. So they'll never, they'll never end up in a, in, a, in a dump or anything like that. Hi. Uh, my name is Danor, and I'm a solar entrepreneur. My question is to Lyndon and Elon. I want to bring design into the conversation. Uh, rooftop solar... If, uh, since it's cheaper and it's cleaner, it's definitely you know, going to take it to a certain point in the market. But uh, there's, there's another uh, argument that real mainstream adoption uh, could also come from making something really desirable, something that people really want more than they Absolutely. really need. Just what Tesla, Nest, and Apple have done. Uh, so my question is, do you agree with that? And if you do, do you think there are design opportunities to capture people's imagination when it comes to solar and something inherently unsexy as that. The, uh, <laughs> be, 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 what? what? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I have a point. Let me, let, me, let me clarify. Something as inherently uns unsexy as electricity. Because uh, people spend no more than six minutes a year thinking about electricity and what turns on their lights. So. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, that's, that point itself is probably the the biggest challenge that we face is educating people how electricity works. It, <laughs> most people don't know what their bill is. Most people don't even know what a kilowatt hour is. They don't even know what their price per kilowatt hour is. And I, if you do a poll, I haven't done this poll, but I suspect it would be like 60, 70% of the people don't know what the bill is. Um, more will know what kilowatt hour is, but... Yeah, most uh, people don't know what the difference between power and energy is. Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. In fact, we often refer to power because people relate to power better, yeah. um, but we sell energy. Yeah. So the, um, the <laughs> uh, uh, on the aesthetics, aesthetics is, is really important. Um, the, uh, we, we made an acquisition just, just recently, uh, a company called Zeb Solar. Uh, one of the primary reasons for the uh, acquisition is their systems aesthetically is the best looking systems in, in, uh, in the country. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a lower flush mount, there's no, no rail, there's no top clamps, so it looks more smooth. Now, now with our resources, we're going to continue to invest in that. And um, as Elon mentioned before, you want to get it to a point that, oh, look, 
he's got a solar system. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, come look at my solar system. Uh, so we really have that, a lot of that already. Uh, it's encouraged by the financial savings, uh, <laughs> and the and, and majority of our business comes from referrals. But you want it to be even a stronger pool. Instead of uh, 30, 40 percent of our business coming from referrals, 80, 90 percent of our business coming from referrals. Making sex, solar sexy, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll have to add foreplay to the solar as well then. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, Adam Langton. I'm with the CPUC Energy Division, and my question is for Elon, and it's regarding battery swapping. And I wanted to see if uh, you've announced that the Model S is capable of supporting um, battery swapping, and I, I wanted to see if you could give us an update on when that would be, uh, when you think that'll be commercializable and, and um, done in practice, and how you think that will impact. Um, the way you sell or even lease vehicles and potentially the way it impacts the, the battery warranty? Sure. So the Model S was designed for, with pa fast pack swap in mind, and we actually demonstrated that um, last year and did a live demo uh, where uh, we were actually able to uh, swap out two uh, the battery packs in, in two Model S's uh, before um, it, faster than, than, than you could fill up a gas tank, so in, in about 90 seconds, uh, uh, to swap out a pack, and the fastest gas station in LA took four minutes to fill up a gas tank. Um, so we're, we're planning to implement that between LA and San Francisco uh, to start off, and then see what the uh, cu customer interest is, um, and, and whether people, you know, what, what percentage of people use that versus supercharging, um, and then um, you know, uh, expand that that uh, capability accordingly. Um, so that, that's our game plan. We're a little delayed on that because we, we got preoccupied in a few other issues, but we're, we're hopefully going to get that uh, enabled in the next few months between LA and San Francisco. Um, I have a question. Um, if we uh, imagine a carbon neutral or nearly carbon neutral future, including the carbon costs of producing the windmills and the solar panels, which out of the missing pieces are there's just like no technological solutions? Which ones are there's technological solution but it's too expensive? And which ones are there's a technological solution, it's cheap enough, but existing players are blocking it? And what are the regulations for each one of the categories? Um, are, like are they different for each one? I'll take a first stab at that. So, so this, the challenge is just looking at uh, a, a, a direct specific cost is you're not including the external cost. So, so when you don't include the external cost, you can either include the external cost, uh, which is hard, um, or you could incentivize those who aren't doing bad things. Um, but if you look at the, the actual cost reduction <coughs> that solar has had uh, over the last few years, it, it, it's, it's been quite amazing. Just, just our cost of South, we've, we've reduced our cost in the last four quarters by, by 30%. So, uh, with scale, renewable energy will be cheaper than fossil fuel-based energy. But we do need to get to, 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 to that scale. And, and it's just an application where you're delivering at the place where it's needed versus having massive centralized locations where you have all this transmission and distribution that you have to take to get it to the point. I think that was your question. <laughs> Uh, uh, Marty Mattis, I'm a regulatory lawyer. Elon, I, I wanted to ask you, um, the, uh, uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, electric vehicle batteries uh, possibly contributing toward shaving the uh, uh, demand curve, to shaving the peak demand uh, off the uh, electric utility demand curve. Right. I'm wondering if uh, you see that as, uh, that characteristic as of any value in the marketing of your products. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think sh shaving that peak demand is is very very important. Um, I mean, it's I should say it's, it's not it's not yet at a at a stage where it, it's an issue for utilities. Like I think utilities will tend to um, overplay the degree to which the um, the, 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 the there's a there's there's excess solar power being generated. So, but but certainly I think uh, once you get to hopefully get to uh, about a 20, 30 percent uh, 
solar power generation at, in, in a particular section of the grid, you definitely need the, the, the storage in order to buffer that, that energy. Um, we're, we're many years from that, uh, but, um, but, it, but it is a very important part of the, the, the equation. And um, I, I, we're, we're not being shy about marketing it, but we, we do want to make sure we, we can meet the demand for that. Um, that's actually part of what we, what Tesla's sort of been, at, um, been doing with the, the Giga factory, the giant battery factory, is to make sure that uh, we, have not, we have production capacity at a compelling price uh, to enable uh, large-scale use of stationary storage. Um, so uh, we hope, hopefully, we'll have that plant up and running in about three years. Hi. I'm Renee Frisse. I am the founder of Social Tech, and it's a company that focuses on how we can use technological innovation for social good. And I was wondering, we, we talked about uh, a culture for innovation, and we talked about game changers. I was wondering if, while you were definitely ga changing the game and having these great innovations, if you come across things that we could use for completely different fields, but they will have a huge social impact as well. And if you are at least thinking about that and perhaps come across things that hinder you or enable that, that could be a question for either one of you. Yeah, I mean, we, we do face this, this, this quite often with, uh, as we continue to scale, um, th there's, there's just a natural <coughs> friction in this. The, often there are uh, utility case studies talking about uh, a cost shift that occurs. And I know that's a lightning rod. And, and to me, that whenever I hear that word cost shift, it, it is a wrong word to use. The word they should use is revenue loss. Because that's what it is. There's a revenue loss. There's no cost shift. There's no cost moving. It doesn't cost more. But you are losing revenue. Based on the utility business model, when you lose your revenue, you get to claim it from somebody else. So, so, so that's the issue. But if, if you want to maintain your revenue. If you want to yes. maintain your re revenue. <laughs> and, and, and actually, on that point, I mean, I can actually won't go that far down yet. It's uh, a revenue shift. Uh, exactly. So it's, it's, it's a revenue shift. I, I need to keep my revenue. And so, so that's what, what it is. Um, but, but it's not costing anything more. And so, so whenever you see cost shift reports, think revenue loss report. And you don't need to do a study for that. If you were getting $200 from the customer before, and now you're only getting 50, you have lost $150. There's no, there's no study you need. It, you've lost $150 rev, uh, revenue. But there wasn't 150 that was cost shift. So that, that's the key, key thing. And then in social uh, uh, media, this is where we can help educate the... the so sure, I mean issue, issue, okay. Okay. But, but, but even then, uh, it's, it's an area where, where, uh, where, where it can help. Um, <laughs> sorry, and what question would you, would you say? Like, what, what? For instance, you developed this super... So let, me, let me ask you just to hold until we get okay. to the microphone. I'm sorry for mixing it up. So it's not social media, social affairs. Let's say you invented this. This is the this. Bay Area. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah I know. It's, that's, okay. I'm Dutch. <laughs> we don't do that here. Yeah. Um, the battery, could you use it for something completely different that will help people? Otherwise, let's say you invented this battery. What else can we use it for? And how can we make sure okay. that all the innovations that you are making are spreading around so we have this snowball effect of good causes and not only in the energy field? Well, um, I mean, the battery is really, um, I mean, at least for, for, you know, the stationary battery is really um, primarily intended to solve the the, uh, the, the the uniform power distribution problem. You know, to be able to generate power continuously and to, to address um, uh, you know peaks and valleys in, in, in renewable power consumption. So, um, I'm not sure how, how in, in other ways, how it might be effective. Um, you know, I mean, certainly the battery will be, I mean, ha having high energy density, low cost batteries will be effective in all modes of transport. I mean, ultimately, I think all transport will go electric with the ironic exception of rockets. Um, <laughs> uh, the cord's not long enough. So, so it's a tough one. Um, no, no way around Newton's third law. 
Um, I, I think I think rockets can be renewable in that you can generate um, the sort of rocket fuel with electricity and, and atmospheric constituents. But Elon, um, it's the anyway. space elevator with the electric yeah. cars going up and down. That's right. Uh, even if you even if a space elevator was useful, you still have to do something once you got to the top of it. Um, so uh, you know you still need a spaceship at you know at the, at the top of the of the elevator. Uh, but but I think I think we can um, you know ultimately move uh, all uh, terrestrial transport uh, to to electric with the, the right battery uh, capabilities. Planes are, are the the hardest because you have a, a very high energy density requirement in order to have long range. Um, but we'll, we'll pl planes will will transform too, um, and um, you know then we make sure that the power generation itself is not uh, carbon creating, it's long term sustainable and we've got a, a good shot. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I'm a big fan of, of the sun because we've got this giant fusion generator in the sky, it's kind of there, it's sort of for free. Um, it's going to be there for a long time. Uh, so that I think is our primary power generation mechanism, but there's also um, obviously a lot of wind, wind is great, uh, geothermal, uh, tidal, you know, there's, there's lots, of, lots of things. Yeah, actually, uh, Vod Solar had a, had a quote. Um, when you uh, have a solar spill, it's called the sunny day. Uh, right, exactly. Well, well let, let me see if I can answer this, this question in a, little, in a little different way, a little more mundane way, but my staff and I were talking about this yesterday as an example. We have a massive program here, the Public Utilities Commission, that all the utilities implement called CARE. It's basically a program for low-income uh, utility uh, users, electric users, if you will, right? Now we have the capability uh, 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 through mapping, through Google and many other things to know where these people live. Now this is going to send horrors up to those, you know, the Tea Party types. But the, uh, and think if maybe with the cost of solar coming down, and let's take uh, southeast Los Angeles County, a lot of very uh, low-income area. We could put solar on all on many of those homes that are low-income recipients, and therefore give them the direct benefit of of lower-cost energy instead of the care program. You follow me? And at the same time, reduce greenhouse gases. That's a twofer. That's the kind of thing you're talking about. That's the kind of social thing that I think will ultimately occur. Well, how fast and all that is up to many of us, including, uh, uh, as Lyndon said, the prices coming, keep coming down and everything else. Uh, there's many, many applications like that. I think you're, you, you will, you will, we will find it'll be, it's depending on our own creativity and ingenuity. Yeah, but it's, I mean, it's worth emphasizing just how far away we are for, from this. Um, if you look at, say, cars, the, there's 100 million new cars roughly to, uh, made every, every year. There's an, in, an installed base or, you know, an existing fleet of almost 2 billion uh, cars it's worldwide. Wor worldwide, yeah. Um, and the, the number of electric cars being, being made is not even 0.1%. So... I mean that's that's pretty pretty tiny, um, so. And, and solar is no. This is slightly different, but it's, it's almost right. the same parry. Yeah, exactly. But but even, let, let's say let's assume like if all cars went to electric tomorrow, it would take 20 years to replace right. the fleet, and we're not even close to all cars, all new cars being made being being electric. No. Uh, solar is not even keeping up with the rate of new home production. No. So there's, I think, 700,000 or something like new homes made every year. And so the, 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 the home um, number of, of ha homes in the, in the U.S. grows by just under 1% a year. And, um, and, and solar's, um, solar's not even keeping up with the new home production, let alone existing homes. The, the industry would have to quadruple just to address the new housing stock. But that's the difference in the state. Oh, yeah. no, no, we have a policy this is, this in this state uh, by 2020 that has some zero net energy consumption uh, for, uh, on, on new homes right. for this state of California. Again, an example where you could be the pace setter and the leader. That's what the nation has to do. Right. But, uh, you know, just uh, it, it's important to appreciate that just, just how tiny it is. Sheer numbers. Uh, and the sheer numbers are really quite small. 
Um, so, uh, you know, it's like, it's like utilities really shouldn't be call, uh, actually, actually, complaining. On, on the, it's like, the utility is like it's a giant and there's like someone tapping on their toe, you know? <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, it's pretty silly. The, the, on, on that point, the, uh, the, a big lightning rod, of course, is, is, is net metering. Um, but the, the cost of net metering today is 0.3% of their revenue. So, so that the whole, back, back to your point of it, touching the toe, it's, it's, it's touching the hair of the toe. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's, it's... We're not even past the decimal point. You know? <laughs> so it's like, maybe, yeah, wait until we get there at least. Uh, hi, Evan Hinman from STEM. This question is primarily for uh, President PV. Um, there are some elements of the electricity industry that seem to make regulation especially hard. The first one is the long asset lifetimes of, let's say, a rooftop solar, 20 plus years, or a transmission line, maybe even 50 plus years. Also, the high technical complexity of you know, keeping the frequency within you know, a few thousand hertz across the state. So how do you think about regulation in that framework? And also, how do you speed up innovation in something with these hurdles around regulation? Well, you're talking in, in some instances of the examples you've given. This is this is just the life, the uh, the life of the asset of the de uh, until it's de totally depreciated. And actually, some transmission lines are 100 years old and still going. I mean, they come out of Big Creek up uh, uh, in the Southern Sierras and go to Southern California. They're over 100 years old. They've been you know updated in, in, in various respects. Got power plants there that are 80, 70, 80 year old, years old. Hydro plants. The but. You know, they're largely depreciated. They're not the challenge. I don't think they're the challenge. I think the challenge is fostering and promoting innovation. So you go, you move that decimal point uh, significantly, and uh, that's that's the challenge here. Not worrying about some of the the, the long-lived assets of the, of the past, which are are largely depreciated. To be honest with you, and just one point: the expected life of the solar system is thirty, thirty-five years. Well, there's some, there's some dispute of that, uh, you know, that's going to be played out before this commission in the short term, but uh, we won't go there any further. <laughs> Hi. I thought I'd throw a little plug there. <laughs> you got it in. <laughs> Hi. Hi, my name's Molly Storkel, and uh, I work in the Energy Division at the Public Utilities Commission. For four years, um, I helped run the CSI program. The woman to my left uh, ran it for the two years after me. That's the uh, California Solar Initiative. And and the man to my right has a signed copy of the bill on his office wall. So, um, with Ed Randolph. Um, so, I want to ask about consumer protection. He wrote it. <laughs> uh, 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 Lily, best program in the world. Okay. No, I, I kid you not. It really, it's the best program in the world. Okay. You hear that? It's good that you have it on your wall. Okay. <laughs> so, I want to talk about the post CSI world a little bit and consumer protection. So, the CPUC has a mission statement um, that says that. We are to serve the public interest by protecting consumers and ensuring the provision of a safe and reliable utility service and actually and infrastructure at reasonable rates, it says. Um, so in the post-CSI uh, post world, um, beyond uh, the, the CSLB, the Contractor State License Board, there is not a lot to protect consumers from bad solar industry actors. Probably everybody in this room has had a negative experience with some kind of contractor, maybe a plumber, Correct. maybe an electrician, maybe a roofer, maybe you've heard about one. Um, so as Solar City grows, it seems to me that one of your big um, you know, concerns to the, to the future world should be how, um, how, are, how is the industry going to be able to withstand itself in the face of the fact that some of your competitors are gonna become bad actors. So I guess um, my question for you and for the whole panel is, you know, do you need regulators to help focus on consumer protection in the industry, even when we're not focusing on rates or we're not focusing on incentives, um, so that your business can continue to grow and innovate? Yeah. The, so as a consumer, you need to make an educated uh, purchase. Um, when the provider who's providing you with electricity is fully aligned with your personal interest, the likelihood it's, it's, it's a it's more probably than not that, it's, that it, it'll be fine. Um, the, the the whole PPA environment has kind of addressed a lot of the the concerns. If it's not producing electricity, you're not paying the vendor. And PPA is power purchase, purchase agreement. Yes, right. yes. So the 
if the system is not installed right, if the quality is not high, you're not paying uh, the, the vendor. It is also a highly competitive landscape. If you build a bad reputation, you're, uh, you won't get customers and your acquisition cost would go too high and eventually you got a business. Um, so in the, uh, as the industry matures, there's already ton of st uh, standards, ton of regulation in the safety and the quality of systems that get installed. So let's think of all the stuff that you already have, uh, uh, your safety regulation, you already have your inspection that, that occurs from the city inspector, you have the utility inspector, so there's, there's a lot that goes on. Um, but then the construction part itself, you, you may be just hire a bad contractor, hire, hire somebody that you know that you can review their uh, training procedures, you know that, they ha uh, that they've got good work, and uh, 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 you should have a, a good experience. But that's not a very satisfactory answer, <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> and, and, I, and I don't, I don't know, I, I think I'm frank enough to say, I don't know the exact answer in these instant cases. On my own experience with solar hot water heating in the 80s, rooftops in La Cañada, where is my principal home, and in San Francisco where I had a home, in both cases after ten, eight, ten years, the system was gone. And you know, we, we just tore it off, off the ceiling and junked, I mean roof and, and, and junked it. It just didn't, it, it, it didn't work. And there was really no, and we were, we had bought the home, someone else had put the solar on it in one instance, and we, uh, the water heating, and we didn't have any recourse, there was nobody to have any recourse to. And so, I mean, you, you have to, uh, Hundreds I, of thousands of consumers like you in California had that experience with solar hot did. water. And it I destroyed know. the industry for 30 years. Yes, it did. Now you've got a great company going, and it could destroy the industry again, yeah. is what my question. So what do regulators yeah. need so, to do so to make what, sure? What, what do we do to, to ensure that the good players succeed and the bad ones don't? And how do we make that judgment? And that's where you, you know, that, that gets to be a very perilous area here as to, you know, government intrusion here. And I don't have a, flat, a, a simple answer for you. But, but I just, just want to point out the slight difference in the, in the hot water. Remember, it, in the business model where you're selling energy, your incentives are aligned with the customer. So in that in exact case, if your business model is to sell hot water per gallon, um, you would have to come, upgrade the system, because you want to sell more, uh, more hot water. So, uh, and, and that's, and that's the, the majority of solar being deployed in the country right now is selling energy. So the, the incentives with the, the uh, provider and the customer are aligned. If the system's not pre uh, performing, if you don't come fix it, you don't get paid. And then you build 20-year contracts off this, you build, you go out and raise debt, you get all the stuff, you have to fix those systems. Hi, um, my name is Rob Cannon. I actually work uh, in the private equity industry. And my question is really at a much higher level. Um, Elon, I think when I think about what Tesla's accomplished in terms of a, a consumer luxury good uh, being what the company has done um, and Solar City expanding to such a large customer base across the country as well, where do you see the influx then for regulation to allow for greater amount of public companies, or private for that matter, to go in to establish an infrastructure if we're working on such a finite timeline. So we've outlined the problem. We know not necessarily a, a definitive date on which it will happen, but we're talking about something that uh, is inevitable. And yet, uh, with other forms of energy, liquid natural gas, fracking and everything else being so mainstream and popular, especially at a federal level and at an export level to those other countries that we've alluded to, where do you see other companies then stepping in beyond luxury goods or beyond luxury items to be more mainstream and to find that point at which the large scale costs needed can then go and become something that we have, not just as a state of California, but as a country, show that model then to the rest of the world. So they look at it as something that's much more measurable in a way that we're not saying, you know, uh, Elon, you gave the example of the cars, you know, needing to replace all of the cars, it would still take 20 years. Well, that seems then that we need to do something 10 years ago, not now. So how do sure. we then motivate those other companies to do something like Tesla did and see that Tesla was able to profit very, very well from it and continue to perform well, but still not be adopted by companies outside of you know, uh, automobiles or solar uh, for, for homes and stuff like that. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm not sure if totally understand it, but I, I think the... Um, 
what we've seen in the in the car industry is that uh, the the movement towards electric vehicles by other car companies seems to be driven for the most part by what the minimum uh, requirements are of, of the regulators so it's it's kind of it's kind of been kind of disappointing um, and and actually California is a leader in that regard so it's like so when for example the California zero emission vehicle mandate um, which was actually set uh, set in place because to, to improve the air in metro metropolitan areas not it wasn't actually to do anything to do with uh, co2 or green you know greenhouse gases it was actually just because people were breathing unhealthy air still are really um, in in major metro areas um, and uh, and it, it just it um, but, but the, the regulatory requirements are so so meager in, in those cases that the big car companies can get away with making virtually no electric cars or, or a very token amount. Um, I really think those those regulations need to be strengthened. Um, and I, cause I think the, the only other way it's going to happen is with competitive pressure from companies like Tesla. Uh, but it's going to take us a while to, to really exert any competitive pressure because we're so little. Um, we're trying to get there as fast as possible, but uh, th th those are the, the only two ways I can see it happening. Um, and uh, you know, I think you know, Seoul is sort of a similar situation. It's um, but, but it, it, a different. I mean, so, so similar. It's, it's it's a different class of problem because you've got a monopoly provider of, of that that's entrenched, um, and so that that's actually even more dependent on on regulatory um, support. Because otherwise, the monopoly provider would just squash any any incumbent. Yeah, and and Solar is still suffering a little bit from from the old stigma that it is a luxury good, and that it is expensive. Uh, people still can't wrap their heads around that you can just get it and just pay for the energy. Hello. Yeah, uh, my name is Yuan Rong. Uh, I'm co I come from Apple, and I am managing a big part of the iPhone hardware hardware develop, product development systems. So I had a question for Elon uh, in terms of batteries. We did, as, as you probably well know, uh, we at Apple buys, uh, is probably one, as well as Tesla, is probably one of the biggest buyers of batteries. So we did quite a, quite a bit of thorough studies on batteries. We understand that um, chemistry, material, packaging, and process does affect uh, cost and performances. Mm -hmm. But just there's one thing I cannot understand, really want to get get an answer from you is um, we, buy, we bought a lot of pouch materials in terms of form factor. And as we know, um, Tesla is, is buying all 18650s. Right. Uh, in terms of portable electronics application, we see uh, the difference between the two form factors to our, uh, in our application is pretty minor from a system perspective. So my question is, what's so special in electric vehicle applications and uh, grid storage applications about 18650. Well, um, in what what energy density are you getting in the at the, the, in the power cell? Sorry, can't talk about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, I get sued. I'm sure it's public domain at this point. Somebody, somebody's probably pulled uh, a laptop apart or an iPhone apart. Uh, but uh, the you know at the 18650 level, we um, in in high production, uh, we can get to 260 watt hours per kilogram. Um, that's considerably better than any pouch cell that I'm aware of. Um, and the cost per kilowatt hour is also the lowest in the 18650 form, format. So that, that's really, those are the two things that matter the most. Um, and so, if, so it, it doesn't make sense for us to go away from the 18650 format. It, it, it does make much more sense for, for Apple making, say, a cell phone or a laptop because the 18650 format is you know, it's, it's sort of 18 millimeters in diameter, so that's, you can't do something like um, a MacBook Air or an iPhone uh, because you'd have a minimum dimensional tolerance of 18 millimeters plus your packaging. Uh, President P. Piemont, Timothy Allen Simon, former commissioner. Um, this week, President Pro Tem Daryl Steinberg uh, proposed a 15% per gallon fuel tax upon 15 cents, 15 cents per gallon fuel tax. Uh, when we're talking about decarbonizing transportation, do you see this as more effective than cap and trade, yeah. or complementing uh, cap and trade? 
Um, yeah, I, I think that, that the right move is a carbon tax, um, and I'd, I'd advocate a, a broad carbon tax, um, uh, but to, to the degree that, you know, if, if, if one can only get sort of a fuel tax, that's, um, that's helpful. Um, but I think in general, the sensible thing to do is to try to correct the unpriced externality, which is the carbon capacity of the oceans and atmosphere, by, um, by, by adding a tax. Um, and then one can uh, adjust that tax accordingly. If, if we're seeing the, the right behavior, which is the movement towards renewables, then, um, then we know the tax is probably high enough. If we're not seeing that movement, it's not high enough. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and frankly, our taxes on, on gasoline are very low in the United States, as I'm sure you know. It's, yeah, compared to the EU. Uh, so the EU taxes, I think, are maybe three, four, five times what they are in the U.S. Um, it's, bit, it's bit way, way higher. Um, and uh, it makes a lot of sense. And it actually does drive people to use more uh, fuel-efficient vehicles, smaller cars, that kind of thing, um, think more about the cost of gasoline. Um, so I think, I think any, any tax on what is, uh, you know, not good for the environment, not good for our future, is that that's the thing one ought to tax. I mean, I think that's the, I think that's the, the, I think the best argument for overall for taxation of, of, of carbon is like, we, we know we need to raise taxes somehow, and it, it, it makes sense, it's just common sense, that we'd want to tax the things that are probably bad way more than we'd want to tax the things that are probably good or neutral. Um, if we're going to collect the same amount of money at the end of the day, um, we should bias the tax structure, um, just as we do in, in many other walks of life, where we tax cigarettes and alcohol more than we do bread, um, and that, that makes sense. Um, and, and so I think, I think, yeah, it's just like, it just seems like common sense to me, but, you know, like, <laughs> it seems like super obvious, but, yeah. Well, yeah, I, if, for a contrary view, at least in part here, I, as, an, as an economist, I would pr preferred a, a, a carbon tax when we started down this road in California. But politicians don't like to be associated with taxes. So, and the EU has done the cap and trade model, and so we copied that. I mean, Mary Nichols and I, we, we, all, we went there 2005, 2006, looked at all this. Now we have adopted a, a cap and trade model for the state of California that, that the, the cap will come down every year, the ceiling will get uh, lower, and uh, the direct uh, impact of that will be, in this instance, on the, the oil industry and on the refineries and all that. So they would prefer to have someone else pay, right? <laughs> you know, the, and the, the idea of the tax per gallon is very appealing uh, to the oil industry. And so the, I think the biggest supporter, and the only supporter of this so far, if there is one other than Senator Steinberg, is, is the Western States Petroleum Association. They think this is really neat stuff. Uh, <laughs> Gets them out from under the cap and trade. But I don't think that it, it, it makes, I think you have to look at this in kind of a, a ho holistically. And, and, and I don't think you should take one sector out from the overall scheme of cap and trade, which is money is, 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 is increasing there. Of course, there's probably some difference as to how that money ought to be spent on high speed rail, uh, things like that. But, uh, uh, you know, I think that program is a good one, and this is not the time now to tamper with it. And I, my guess is there will be very little appetite to do anything about this, particularly in an election year, in terms of that, that uh, formula that, that he's come up with. Yeah, I can just say, I think it's, it's time for us to get serious on, on a carbon tax on a national basis. I mean, any, uh, any, any, any economy, yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, basically it's economics 101. I mean, it's like really... You know, uh, this is British so. British Columbia's done it. I mean, yeah, but but it, it's like so obviously the right move. I think politicians ought not to be afraid of it. It's, I, I think they 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 ought to give it a, give it a shot and, and do do a carbon tax. The time is now. Yeah, I mean, just, just so people understand, it, it's not that your taxes increase. You're just shifting it. You just shift it. You shift it. <laughs> so, just, so, 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 you, yeah. so, so just just to understand, is a carbon tax. You got to. You all pay your federal taxes, <laughs> right. okay? Your 25% uh, that you pay, you put whatever percentage to to the carbon, and that, that's that's just a shift. Yeah, yes, but but elected. I mean, so let's obvious. be candid here. I mean, elected officials 
like to have things indirectly rather than directly. Well, that's that's the nature of it. I agree that a carbon tax on a national basis would be better, speaking as, as a policymaker, but I just don't see that happening in the short term. I don't see Obama embracing it. I don't see anyone else embracing it uh, that's uh, in office. And so then you go to, to, to second best, and you can't, you don't want the good to be the enemy uh, uh, of, of the, you know, the best being the enemy of the good. Uh, major policy in this area is, has, has been adopted in the state and we're moving in that direction and I, and I hope that we stay the course until we can go to a, a, broader, based, a, a broader base which would be on a federal level. That's just that's my personal perspective on this. Hi, my name is Hushwin. I work in the solar industry. My question is around uh, financing. Traditionally, um, the expansion and proliferation of DG and solar around the world has relied on government credit or you know, 700 plus FICO credits and investment grade um, buyers of power. Um, there are programs like the CARE programs and other low income housing programs, but typically, um, at least in the US, uh, federal tax equity investors are major banks and quite conservative in terms of who they will and will not uh, finance. How can innovation and regulation help um, expand solar or battery or other high um, upfront cost items to allow for financing to the masses? So is it for the uh, regulation or innovation? <laughs> the, um, so, so, so it is true. So, so if you look at the, the history of, of, of solar financing, it started off with a FICO score of 720. Uh, and like other financing, it's binary. Either you're in or you're out. When you buy a house, it's not binary. It's just your, your cost is higher. Uh, uh, as the market has matured, it's gone down to 700. Then it went down to 800. We're now starting to see 650. So, so, um, so that will really start broadening the market. Another key interesting point, when, when we look at our deployment, the majority of our adoption is in zip codes with uh, low to medium income. So it, it's, it, it's, it's not the big, uh, uh, big uh, wealthy homes that adopt, uh, doing the majority of the adoption. It, it's, it's just the average household. Um, and as you drop the FICO, that, that will improve. As Data supports the default rates. Investors will get more and more comfortable. We just did a securitization. It's the first securitization in uh, uh, world history of solar, solar assets. It was a big lift, and um, uh, we succeeded at that. Uh, but the data just shows that it's unlike a, a, uh, a, a, a boat financing or something else, that it is an energy bill, so the, the default rates are extremely low, and then the tax equity guys will start getting used to this, and then they'll, they'll open it up and, and drop it down to 650. Um, we're gonna take one more question and then uh, do some uh, closing remarks because I know President Peavy has to leave promptly at 3.28 or 3.30. Oh, it's on, thank you. Uh, you know, I'll be really quick since we're at the end. Uh, my name is Bob Barish. I've just happened here by happen chance, happenstance today. I'll make, just say really quick, drought, fear, game changer on energy and water and implications for what you've been talking about today because change happens in crisis. You know, I've been watching energy for 40 years. It's been a long, hard slog to get to here. It seems to me a drought of a few more months or a few more years like this is a game changer, whether it's caused or aggravated by human activity or not. Sorry, I'm not sure what the question is. The of the oh, drought for oh, oh, for the drought. Uh, okay. Um, sure. Uh, yeah, I'm not maybe I'm not the best one to answer it's, that question. So, 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 so this is actually a perfect application for for solar. So, so solar doesn't use much water at all. Um, the <laughs> uh, uh, the it has a crazy fact. I, th I think most people don't know this. This is an, uh, a U.S. fact. The average household uses more water in the creation of electricity than water consumption itself. Think about that. That's a good point. Thank you. So, so, <laughs> so, 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 so all the curtailment that's occurring in California for the drought, it pales to the benefit of installing a solar system. Because by installing a solar system, you've essentially netted out 
your water consumption. So um, as, as market plays out, uh, back to the external cost, <coughs> now you have carbon, that's another external cost. Sorry, let me make sure we get you on the microphone now. Yeah, well, I mean, but look, we don't, we don't know if this, if the, the consequences, how long this is going to last. We do know from, you know, thousands, of, looking at, at, at rings and trees that we could be in a very prolonged drought period. On the other hand, we've had situations where it's rained like hell in March and April in this state, and it's come back out of it. If this lasts more than a year or two, it takes some. It will require some fundamental rethinking of of how we use water, in particular, because we don't have enough water compared to all the demands for water. And and we 80 percent of that water goes into agriculture. And the and the crops that are most demanding are cotton, alfalfa, rice, and a few others. And there's there's some ration there be. We ought to get away from some of that and let, uh, let these things be done elsewhere. There's a lot of other aspects that, that could be done in water conservation and, and, and uh, a much better use of groundwater, uh, so-called toilet to tap, all those kind of things we will be forced to do if this drought continues, and it's a game changer in that regard, I think, yes. I think that the, the governor and others realize that. But trying to predict the, the, in the short term Weather functions from year uh, function, uh, is just almost impossible. But it does, it is a warning bell that we have to be a heck of a lot more conscious of this and have to move to a far more sustainable environment. And let me invite each of the panelists to speak just for one minute or 90 seconds, closing remarks, anything that's on your mind. Elon, why don't we start with you? Uh, well, I, I think the uh, most important thing is, is for regulators to ensure that uh, there's rapid adoption of, of sustainable energy. Uh, that, that is it's overwhelmingly important. I really hope that someone politically does do the carbon tax. It's the smart move. It needs to happen now. Um, and, uh, and I think if, if, we, if we do take action now, uh, the, the, the damage will be, will be limited, still be significant but limited. And if, if we don't take action now, it's going to be far worse than anyone realizes. Lyndon, closing remarks. You know, the, um, being in California, I'd say, is, is, is fantastic. California has led the way in this. It has uh, shown a massive movement towards uh, solving this problem. Uh, it's set uh, you know, the stage for, for many other states and countries to follow. Uh, so I actually think it's, it's a super exciting time to be in this space. Um, we're going to see this transformation occur. There's going to be resistance. But eventually, everybody will get on the same page and solve the problem. And Mike Peavy with the last word. Vote Democratic. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank uh, Marzia Zafar, the director of the PUC's Policy and Planning Division. I'd like to thank <laughs> Lyndon Rive of Solar City, President Michael Peavy of the Public Utilities Commission, and Elon Musk of many things. Thank you very much. Good afternoon.